you so much for all of your cards and greetings, and I appreciate all of you. Uh, been pastoring here 36 years, going on 37. Was a young man when I came here, and I feel like a young man now. Amen. Let's uh, hear what God has to say in Nehemiah chapter 4 today. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 1. and This is the story about one man's burden to do a great work for God. If you'll ever get called of God to do something, really called, it, it, it works on you. It's something that you don't take lightly or carelessly as so many take church today. But when a man or a woman gets a burden, whether it's for children in the children's ministry or teen ministry or bus ministry or singing, whatever it is, it's a burning desire inside of you to do a great work. Nehemiah had a burning desire. When it came to pass that when Sambalik heard that we were building the walls, he was wroth, he was mad. He took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Anytime you get ready to do anything for God, it stirs hell up. Somebody said, well, I thought if I was working for the Lord, everything would go well. Wrong. Hell is going to get mad at you and do everything it can to stop you from being successful in what God has called you to be. Verse 16, it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants wrought in the work. The other half of them held both the spears, the shields, the bows, the habergeons, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. And they which built it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laden, every one with one of his hands wrought he the work. With the other hand he had a weapon. In one hand he's working, in another hand he's, he's battling, he's fighting. And that's how life is, folks. For the burden, everyone had his sword girded by his side, and he built it, and he battled. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into this place this morning giving praise and thanksgiving to our God that has been so good to us. You are worthy of all of our praise and our honor. We come today in this house to worship you, Lord. Have your way in this place. Now, Lord, let the word be preached. Let the bread be broken. Let lives be changed and charged and challenged. Don't let one person leave here today without receiving a supernatural touch of a holy God. And Lord, everything that you do in this house will give you praise, honor, and glory. And everybody shouts. One more time. Man is a builder. I want to talk about uh, uh, building and battling this morning. Man is a builder. He was created to build. We're building a spiritual house. Therefore, the Lord said, build on the rock Jesus Christ because the wind is coming, the storm is coming, the rain is going to pour, and you've got to be built on Jesus Christ if you're going to stand. Well, I want to tell the devil today that everybody that builds on Jesus, we don't have to worry about what's coming against us, what the devil's trying to do to us. After the smoke settles, praise God, we'll still be standing. How many know we've been through a whole lot in the last year or two, but thank God we're still standing. Now, now, people who are out of church today, people that are shipwrecked because they blame it on COVID, they blame it on the pandemic, but the problem has been their foundation because if you have the right foundation, hell cannot move you. Are you hearing me today? I don't know what we're going to have to face as a church or as a nation, but I know one thing. We're built on the rock, Jesus Christ, and we will overcome, and we will stand. Oh, hallelujah. We're building marriages and families and ministries and churches. We're building relationships and, and a Christian walk with God. We're building a life that will determine our destiny. So I want to talk about building today, but you can't talk about building without talking about battling. They come hand in hand. If you're going to build anything today, spiritually speaking, you've got to have a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other because the devil's going to do everything to destroy 
destroy everything you're trying to build. You will be met with adversity and resistance. Am I preaching to anybody? Has the devil tried to stop you this week? Then you ought to pull your shoulders back and say, devil, I told you I would make it through this week. You tried to stop me, but I told you I'd show up in church on Sunday morning. I told you I was not giving up. I know hell hit me, but I told you I was going to stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He, you will be met with resistance. Building won't be easy. He will, the devil will come to tear up your marriage and your family and your church and your ministry. So you're going to have to build a while and battle a while. Say it with me. Build a while and battle a while. Now that's exactly what's taking place in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a prisoner in the palace. He's a cupbearer, a servant to the king, and he hears about Jerusalem. Now, number one, Jerusalem is his hometown. Number two, Jerusalem is the place of worship to God. He's 500 miles away, and the, church, the, the city is in a horrible condition, which parallels to the church today. They are left uh, or are in great affliction and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down. The gates of the city are burned with fire. He He's saying it is in a terrible condition. The place where we go worship. He said it's in a terrible position. He's 500 miles away. But something happens to this man. When he hears about how the, the, the city of God is being brought down. I want to tell you. Well, we need to get a burden for the Lord in our soul. Amen. So he got a burden. Let me tell you what he did. Let me show you the evidence of getting a burden. He mourned. He fasted. And he prayed. Prayed. Oh God, would we get some mourners back in the church? Would we get some people that will fast back in the church? Would we get some people that know how to pray back in the church? Oh, come on now. And we will turn the church upside down for the glory of God. I know the devil thinks he's defeating the church today, but he's a liar and the father of all lies. We're here today to say, no, devil, we have a burden for our church. When you get a burden, it's something about the power of a burden moves the hand of God. You want to move God's hand, get a burden. I'm not talking about an urge. I'm not talking about maybe a want to, a little desire. I'm talking about a burden, a burden that keeps you upset and restless because you got to do something. Have you ever been there? I got to do something in the kingdom. I got to do this. I got to witness to that person. I, I got to teach that little class of children. I, I've got to minister to teens. I got to do something. There's something messing with me inside. And I know it looks impossible. Nehemiah is 500 miles away. He is not a carpenter. I get so tired of hearing people say, I can't do it. I, I can't do this. I can't do that. Yes, you can. If God's with you, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Nehemiah's in captivity, and it's beyond his power. He does not have the skill or the ability, so it looked like it was nothing he could do. It looked like it was beyond his reach, and he began to pray. And he began to mourn. And he began to, to seek God and fast. And when he did, God heard his prayer. God saw his tears. And God said, I'm going to send you to rebuild the walls. I know you don't know what you're doing. I know you're 500 miles away. But I'm God. And if God says do it, it can happen. I want to tell you, the impossible can become the possible. Because God is a God of greatness. When you got a burden, listen, God will open a door that no man can shut. He'll make a way where there is no way. I'd never underestimate the power of a man's burden. God moves when you have a burden. Get a burden for, for, for the church. I, I know here's what the devil has done in the last days. He keeps our eyes off of God and off the burden. And our eyes are on politics. Our eyes are on covid we're fussing over take a shot or don't take a shot. 
wear a mask or don't wear. We better quit that spirit of division and say, hey, look, you do what you want to do. But I made my mind up. I'm not going to let it take my Christ likeness. I'm going to love you with a mask or without a mask, with a shot or without a shot. Let's quit fussing and fighting. We need to get a burden to rebuild the church. You know what I'm talking about? This church was packed on Sunday morning at the 9 and the 11 o'clock. You know what I'm talking about. And, and it'll never happen again till we get a burden to see God fill it up again. My prayer is, God, give us a burden for souls. Give us a burden for the lost. Man, I'll tell you what, people are dying and going to hell, and we need to reach out to them. We're, 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 we're so uh, comfortable in our Christianity and in our religion. When's the last time you invited somebody to church? When's the last time you told them about Jesus? Oh, come on now, I'm preaching better than you, amen. God, give us a burden for people that are lost. Let me say this. This is going to hurt. Fast the seatbelt. Give us a burden for our own families. They're laying out of church, won't come to church, won't bring grandkids to church. Oh, I'm preaching now. Give us a burden that God, that you'll change their hearts and revive them, oh God. Hallelujah. So when Nehemiah got back to Jerusalem, it was worse than they had even said. Things get worse before they get better, don't they? I've learned that in ministry. When things get real bad and get worse, get ready. God's getting ready to do something. When it looks like it ain't going to happen, God shows up just in time. But God had a man named Nehemiah that had a burden. And it was a miracle burden. It moved him 500 miles to his hometown. And, and, and I want to say this. I thank God for his miracles. Now, you may think the days of miracles are over, but I'm telling you, God has worked miracles in my life. Can I get a witness out there? Does anybody know God is still a miracle-working God? He's still a healer and a deliverer and a soul satisfier. God is still a miracle-working God. Amen. Oh, it could happen today. I don't know what you have need of, but God can meet that need. It may look impossible, but God can step in this place and turn your life around. Hallelujah! My God. Amen. Don't ever underestimate what God can do. When you see all the bad going on, and the Bible says it was going to happen, lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. Things are getting bad for the world. Things about to get good for the church. Oh, come on now. So Nehemiah begins to work. He has a, he's a man on a mission. And people saw him, his passion, his zeal, and his burden. And they started connecting with him. They started joining in with him. They started working with him. Can I tell you, if you really, really, really get it, other people will get it too. Listen, people are not ready for hypocrites and lukewarm and people play in church. But if you ever get a vision and a burden of the Lord, I'm telling you, folk will jump on that wagon and say, my God, we can do it. Hallelujah. And that's what happened to Nehemiah. People started getting with You see, I, I've learned this over the years. Uh, uh, murmuring and complaining is contagious. You, you, you complain to one person, next thing you know, be 25, 30, all over Facebook. And that, that gossip and that complaining and that murmur is putting a knife in your ministry and in your heart. But I've learned that a burden is contagious. So, so I've told people that are working in church and we're so apt to look at people that won't help us. And, and I don't know why I'm having to do all this. But maybe you're going through a season that God is saying, this is where I want you. Uh, I know that sounds, sometimes you just have to say, God, I, if I got to do it by myself, but 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 sometimes we get. I don't have no help. I'm working myself to death. Now we're talking about an hour or two, maybe three hours a week. Three, say three hours a week. I, oh, I'm not belittling anybody working and serving, but we're talking about three hours a week, and we talk, and so that complaining it drives people away from our ministry. 
if we'll start saying God is doing great things. I saw somebody this week and they said, how's church? I said, God's doing great things. God's still on the throne. I, I tell you, if you got a burden, you ought to be an encourager and that will draw people to you. Nehemiah learned that you need two things if you're going to build. If you're going you're to need these. Scripture says Nehemiah took in one hand an instrument of building, a hammer. He took in the other hand a sword to fight. And all the people that worked on the wall had a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other. And they were ready to build a while and battle a while. And sometimes you're building and you're working and you're serving and hell hits. And you got to lay your hammer down and go back and get your sword. Say, devil, let me tell you something. I've come too far to quit now. Take your hands off of me. Take your hands off my mind. I will not stop. It will always be this way. You got to build and you got to about. There's no other way to build. If you're going to build a happy marriage, you're going to have to build a while and battle a while. Hell is after your marriage. And you're going to have to stand in the gap and, and, and take up the sword and say, I'm not letting the devil have my, my marriage. And if you have a good, solid relationship with God or, or, or if you have a destiny or a successful ministry or a great church, you're going to have to build a while and battle a while. It's seasonal. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I see it as a pastor. It's seasonal. I feel like I'm building, building, building. All of a sudden, something will happen. There will be a, 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 an attack There'll be something done over here, something done, and I have to stop a minute, pull my sword out, and fight the devil off your life. Oh, come on now. If you won't quit, you will build. The only way you cannot build is to quit. Now, when Nehemiah and the people got started rebuilding, the devil came immediately. Sambalic, Tobiah, types of the devil heard that Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls, and they got mad. I don't care how mad the devil gets. Honestly, I want the devil mad at me. I want the devil, when I get up of the morning, and say, look out, he's up again. Hallelujah. I want him to have my, my bu bulletin on his bulletin board, most wanted. Uh, preaching the gospel, reading the word, serving the Lord, man with a burden. Somebody say amen. I want when he wants to send demons to my house, I want them to say, devil, I really don't want to go there. Because if I go there, he's going to pull out that spiritual sword and he's going to defeat us. I want to tell you, devil, I don't care how mad you get. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So I'm ready to fight. Anybody ready to fight? Now get this, get this. I'm ready to build, but I'm also ready to fight. And that's what it takes. Now when you're busy building, you're going to have to battle. And there are three things you must have to build. Get this. Number one, you must have a mind to work. Don't try to mess with me. I'm working for the Lord. They tried to get Nehemiah off the wall. Come down. We got to talk to you. He said, I'm doing a great work for the Lord. His mind was made up. My mind is not on winning uh, 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 or uh, an argument over with you or fussing with you. I don't have time for that. My mind's on the work. We need to keep our mind on the work of the Lord. You must have a heart to pray. Because without prayer, nothing you do will be effective. Whether you're, you're driving a bus or playing an instrument or teaching a class, you got to pray over it. Hallelujah. It is the anointing that grows and ministers to your ministry. And then number three, you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Quit looking at what everybody else is saying and doing what every other church is doing. I'll tell you what, it's time to keep our eyes on those. People send me videos about the, the, the vaccine and videos about this. And, 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 and let me just share what I do. I delete them. I don't have time to wrestle. My eyes are on the Lord. I want to tell you I'm going to heaven vaccinated or not vaccinated. I'm going to heaven mask or no mask. Amen. I'm telling, but I'm going to love everybody. I'm not going to fight and fuss over this crazy stuff. I've got my eyes on the Lord. Anybody got your eyes on the Lord? Somebody say, how, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, let the trumps of God sound and the dead in Christ get up and take us home, oh God. Hallelujah. 
Now, without these three things, you will be discouraged. Without these three things, you will be so down and out. Discouragement is when the enemy gets on the inside of you. It's not what's going on all around you. It's what got in you. It's when you start believing what the devil has said. You start believing what you see. You start losing courage. You become disheartened. And then you begin to believe, I can't do it. Discouragement comes when you got, you got to lay your hammer down and pick up your sword. Because I'm telling you one thing, this spirit's going to get off me. I'm tired of dealing with this depression and this discouragement and this harass. Devil, you're going to get off me. Somebody shout amen. If you don't, it'll torment you and discourage you. When David was at Ziglag, typical example, the enemy had come in and kidnapped his family and all the children, all the women, and burned the city to the ground, taking the family's prisoner. All of the men, the great men of, of, of honor and, and power uh, uh, had killed thousands of men. They sat out and cried bitterly. Before long, though, they started looking for somebody to blame. And they pointed their finger at David, forgetting that David had lost his family and his children, and he was hurting too. But the Bible says, now here it is, David encouraged himself in the Lord. He said, if you don't like me, and you won't help me, and you won't support me, and I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll preach to myself. Oh, somebody say Amen. I'll lift myself up. I'll, I'll get in the presence of God all by my. I've learned that people want to clap their hands and praise God and say amen. That's good. If you don't, I'm getting in the presence of God anyhow. Hallelujah. David said uh, he encouraged himself. You've got to learn how to preach to yourself. I, I mean all by yourself. When there's no crowd to support you. When nobody's there to amen you or encourage you or say that's a good sermon, you got to grab a Bible in one hand and a bottle of anointing oil in the other and put your suit on and preach to the man in the mirror. Oh, I'm preaching now. Can't nobody preach to you like you can preach to you. If you'll ever get a hold of this, you'll start getting encouraged. Quit laying in the bed with a cover over your head, feeling sorry for yourself. Get up, dress, take a shower, and begin to preach the gospel to yourself. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. We have power over all the power of the devil. If God be for me, who dare be against me? I'm going through whatever the devil brings me to. God's going to bring me through. It's not over. It's just begun. Hallelujah. Preach to yourself. Now, I, know, I, I, know that, uh, I know that you're sitting there and many times you wouldn't even help me preach. You got to learn to preach to yourself. Faith coming by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. But let me give you a translation that speaks to me. Here's what faith is. Faith comes to your spirit when your spirit hears your mouth speak the word of God. Something powerful about you speaking the word of God. One thing for me to say it, another thing for you to say it. Amen. Somebody say, say, amen. amen. Say it again. Amen. amen. Let hell hear you say amen. Glory to God. The Bible calls it the profession of our faith, the testimony of our faith. We're overcomers by the testimony of our faith. When, when the people uh, that were helping Nehemiah began to be discouraged, Nehemiah began to encourage them and, and told them to encourage themselves. And here's what he said to listen to this now. Number one, he said, Remember the Lord. He said, you are God's child. Remember, it's his work. Remember, he's called you. Remember, he anointed you. Remember, he chose you. Remember, he selected you. Remember, you're doing his work. 
Remember who dare stand against you if God be for you. Remember, God is on your side. If it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you would have been swallowed up a long time ago. This is evidence today that the Lord is on my side. I'm here. The Lord is with us. Remember that. Remember his grace is sufficient. He said, remember God. Remember this is not a, 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 a carnal work. This is, this is to be taken. This is God's work. Now, I want to tell you something. I know the office of president is, is a high office and a place to be honored. But the greatest office and honor is to be called of God because he is going to use you in a mighty way. Number two, he says, not only remember God when you're discouraged. Remember your children. Remember your wives. Remember your families. That's why you can't give up and lay out a church and, and, and stay at the beach or the mountains every weekend and never bring your kids to church. You'll lose them to hell. We have a response. God said, remember those children. Remember your wife. Remember your family. You've got to do this work. Amen. Parents need to fight for their children. Get them in children's ministry and teen ministry and every area of ministry. Get them involved, loving the church and connected to the church. Years ago, some people I know, they did not come to this church, but they were very actively involved in church. Something happened and they got out of church. They were very, very active. Their children were very young and they got out of church. Today, their children are grown and have children of their own. Years later, the man got cancer and was dying. I went by to pray for him, and he said, Pastor Jeff, he said, it looks bad, I know. He said, but I've made everything right with God. I've prayed, and to my knowledge, everything is okay, and I'm ready for heaven. And I thought, man, that's great. But at the funeral, his daughter that does not go to church, came up to me and said, would you please pray for my brother? He's an atheist. What are you saying? This man may have gotten things right with God before he died, but chances are he's going to lose his children to hell. And I've always said there's only one thing worse than dying and going to hell, and that's to carry your children to hell with you. They are watching you, and God, Nehemiah said, if you want to be, remember your children. Remember, discouragement is not uncommon. Just a few things, and I'm going to close. Anyone who has had success has had to battle discouragement. When the founder of Chick-fil-A built his first store, in a matter of weeks, it burned down. Before it ever got started, business ever started going, it burned down. He was discouraged but decided to build another one. When the, store, the second store was finished, the founder's brothers, who were his partners, were flying in for the grand opening. Everything finally looked like things were going to work out well. But on the flight to the grand opening, the plane crashed and killed all of his brothers. Most people would have quit right there. But he went on to build and battle through it all. Now he's one of the largest chicken restaurants in the world. Henry Ford went uh, uh, into automobile business for the first time. He was bankrupt. He regrouped, tried again, bankrupt, lost everything this time. How many of you know that's discouraging? He took a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other, and he kept on building. And he became a great success because he chose to fight the battle. Last but not least, a man went to 16 different publishers, companies. He tried to get his book published. The publishing company told him he had no talent whatsoever. They said, you'll never make it. Give up on trying to be a writer. The 17th publisher published the book. It sold 6 million copies in its first printing. Dr. Seuss. There's a lot of folks that the devil has tried to discourage, and they've given up. But I want to tell you, if you'll get back up, 
grab a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other? Did you know in 52 days, Nehemiah rebuilt all the walls? And you and I can do what God has called us to do in the spite of adversity, in the spite of discouragement, in the spite of pandemic. God will use us to do great things. Stand to your feet and give God praise.